15. The illusion of peace shattered, Uldisian lived in a constant state of high concern. Malik was nearby, no doubt plucking something insidious. As ever, Uldisian didn't fear so much for himself as much as he did for the others. However, as Achilles had said, they would not leave him of their own free will, and he had no idea how to make them change their minds. Noticing his darkening mood, Master Ifan pulled him aside after dinner the next evening. You are not yourself. Does something ail you? There's nothing. The dark eyes burned into his own. Yes, I think that there is, but you do not wish to talk now, Ifan frowned. The other night, I offered whatever help I could to you. I think this is just such a situation. Perhaps, if we met alone when the others were asleep, I could at the very least pass on some advice. Since the death of his parents, Odysseus had more or less relied on his own advice over the years, only now and then turning to the likes of Cyrus and other friends of his father. Still, the merchant had seen much and lived through more, and surely had a view of matters far exceeding that of the farmer. Uldisian finally nodded gratefully to his host. Thank you, I would like that. Later then, murmured Master Ifan. Say, the hour before midnight? Nodding again, Uldisian returned to the company of Lilia and the others. It was all he could do from that point on to hide his impatience. The minutes took hours to pass, the hours an eternity. When at last he excused himself from Lilia, the noblewoman becoming used to his late-night walks, Uldisian almost ran through the house, so eager was he to reach the study and pour out his concerns. On his way he nearly collided with a smaller figure. Cedric looked up at him, the youth's face oddly pale. Said, what are you doing still up? The boy glanced past, as if impatient to be away from the man before him. Father, my father wanted to see me. Now I'm going to bed. Already feeling late for his own meeting with Master Ifan, Uldisian patted the merchant's son on the shoulder. Of course, off you go then. Without waiting for a reply from the boy, he continued on. The halls were dimly lit, only a few oil lamps marking the night time. Uldisian passed no guards, the merchant obviously feeling very secure in his own domain. That would certainly change once he heard what his guest had to say. The door to the study was closed, and no light shone through the bottom. Uldisian looked around the empty hole, then knocked once. From within, Ifan's voice bid him to enter. Relieved, Uldisian slipped inside, quickly shutting the door after him. The only illumination in the room came from a single candle situated atop a small mahogany table to the side. Next to the candle sat a decanter of wine and two goblets, one of which Uldisian's host, seated in a leather chair next to the table, took up even as the farmer's eyes adjusted to the gloom. Tonight I find the quiet of the night much more relaxing, explained Master Ifan after a sip of wine. The better to think also. Uldisian slipped into another chair that Master Ifan indicated. Thank you for seeing me. How could I not? After all that's happened? Uldisian, I couldn't refuse this moment to you. He gestured at the other goblet. Please, I would recommend it. Although he wanted to keep a clear head, Uldisian suddenly felt parched. He allowed Master Ifan to pour him some wine. The liquid flowed like delicious fire down his throat. A strong vintage, but one that touches the soul, I dare say. Ifan put down his own goblet. You are very troubled, my son. Clutching the wine in both hands, Uldisian leaned forward and explained his concern for his friends, and for Parfa itself. The older man listened quietly, nodding now and then in understanding. When Uldisian had finished, Master Ifan rubbed his chin in thought. The flickering candlelight danced in his eyes, catching the farmer's attention. Your fears for my people and your own comrades does you justice, Uldisian. 
I would hope to do no less myself in such a situation. But what can I do to keep them, all of them, from harm? I don't know if I can protect everyone, not from the might of the triune. I thought I could once, but after the other night... The leader of Parfa rose and began to pace slowly in front of Uldisian. His mind was visibly at work. Yes, the other night, as you describe it, shows an inconsistency in your gift I would not have expected. It was a telling moment. Ifan paused, looking down at him. You may be correct. What you wield might not be enough against the force of the temple. Their tools are legion. I have heard from trusted sources that they have fanatic warriors which make the peace warders seem like children. Some claim that these armored figures cannot even be slain by mortal means. His description struck home with Uldisian. Yes, the attacker in the street. As I said, Achilles should have slain him with a bolt, but it only startled him. The older man stepped from the vicinity of the candlelight, all but disappearing in the shadows in the far corner of the room. So, the stories have merit. It almost makes me suggest... But no, you would never do that. What? Uldisian was willing to do almost anything, if it would at least protect the woman, the people, that he loved. Tell me. Master Ifan turned to face him again. If not for the fire of the candle reflecting yet again in his eyes, Uldisian would not have been able to read anything of his expression. In that gaze, though, he saw determination, and that strengthened his own resolve. There is one way to protect them, and my beloved Partha, but I feel much guilt even suggesting it. Please! I won't hold anything against you, Master Ifon. You've been nothing but a good friend and host. Very well. It may be, my young Uldisian, that you can only accomplish what you wish by leaving them without any notice. Leave them in the dead of night and ride away from Partha, as if the hounds of the temple are nearly in the town. Ride out and meet with this Malik. Uldisian leapt to his feet, the goblet dropping and the chair falling backward. What? Hear me out. Malik came for you. He only wants you. Whatever the outcome of your encounter with him, by abandoning Parfa and the others, you remove them from the situation entirely. The triune will trouble them no longer. The terrible thing was, what he said had not gone unconsidered by Uldisian already. Yet to hear it said so bluntly, put a solid weight to it that pressed down hard on his heart. But it would keep all of them safe, especially Lilia. Still, there was something else to think about. But the minions of the high priest are already in Partha. It might be too late to undo that. They watch for you. They will assuredly see you leave, even if you choose to do it in this very minute. Such creatures will immediately follow their prey. Or does that not make sense? To Uldisian, it already made dreadfully perfect sense. And yet, there was that about Master Ifan's suggestion that didn't sit right with him. But it's the only way, his mind insisted. The merchant stood silent, letting Uldisian battle this out himself. Leaving the others behind was the only course of action. This was only between he and Malik. They would all follow me, you think? The creatures of the high priest, I mean. I would guarantee it. To do anything on the contrary would be absurd. That finally settled it for Uldisian. I've got to do it then. His host bowed in acknowledgement of the heaviness of this decision. I will assist you in the best of my ability, any way I can. Ivan reached out a hand. Uldisian instinctively did the same, but just before the two men could shake, a sense of urgency overtook the son of Diomedes. He pulled his hand back and stared at the merchant's eyes. There was something wrong about them. He tore his gaze away from the merchants, suddenly needing to look towards the ceiling. It was too late. From the darkness above, a heavy, armored form fell upon the farmer. 
it brought them to the floor, their combined weight cracking the boards beneath them. There is ever something that causes the best plans to go awry, snapped a voice which was not the merchant's. I begin to wonder if it has to do with your curious and unpredictable ability. Even as Uldisian struggled against the opponent, he recognized the voice. It was Malik speaking. Malik in the guise of Master Ethan. All so very simple, or so it was supposed to be. Lure you out into the wild, where this could be handled without any complications. But, as with last time, nothing can go simple where you are concerned, farmer, can it? His face almost crushed into the floor, Uldisian gasped. Where, where is Ethan? Why, right here, replied the voice that was now both Malik's and the merchant's. Let him see, the cleric ordered Uldisian's guard. From behind, a thick hand grabbed the captive by the hair and pulled hard, forcing him to look up. The image of the merchant still stood before Uldisian. Right here in the flesh, Ifan said, once more using the voice of the high priest. The figure chuckled, then added, or at least wearing his flesh. He reached up and touched his cheek with the palm of his right hand. Where the hand came in contact with the face, the skin there suddenly dripped as if melting. In large portions, it started sliding down the chin, where it hung in gobbets. Uldisian's stomach turned. He struggled to free himself, but the monstrous warrior had him in a tight grip. Through the macabre display, the high priest's own dark countenance began to peek out. Malik pulled his hand away, which caused the horrific melting to cease. He showed Uldisian the palm. Revealed there was a sight more terrible than the face, for it was no human hand that Malik had, but rather something that matched his demonic heart well. The high priest flexed what passed for fingers, and it amazed Uldisian that he had not noticed the misshapen appendage despite the disguise. A simple use of misdirection and illusion, explained Malik, reading his expression or his thoughts. He thrust the limb closer. Granted me by my master to assist in this hunt. I tested it twice before the merchant, whom the Morlu caught as he was returning to his home. He was an opportunity that I could not pass up. Uldisian spat at the man, unfortunately coming up short with the effort. His guard, a Morlu, the high priest had called it, rewarded the captive's attempt by slamming Uldisian's face in the floor again. That will be enough, Malik commanded, whether to his prisoner or the guard it was impossible to say. Raise this fool up. Another pair of powerful hands took hold of Uldisian's right arm. The original Morlu shifted to the left. The two armored giants held Uldisian in vice-like grip. Not as I originally intended, but this will do. The door opened. Glancing there, Uldisian saw in horror that Cedric had returned. Go! he shouted to the youth. Run! But instead of obeying, or at least looking fearful, Cedric ignored the warning. To Malik he said, the woman is not in the room. The blood drained from Uldisian. The voice coming out of Ifan's son was no more that of the boy than Malik's had been the merchant's. No, he gasped. No. She must be there, insisted the cleric. I sense her there even now. The arm too verifies that. It is drawn to her, as the master said. You looked in the wrong room. Cedric shook his head. With a dismissive shrug towards the gaping Uldisian, he grunted, This one sends all over the room, and the bed. Nothing of her, no smell, no trace. Malik reconsidered. I see. This is a wily prey, certainly more so than this buffoon. Uldisian couldn't make sense of everything that was said, but one bright point stuck out. 
Malik had sent this abomination, tears streaked down Uldisian's face as he thought of what happened to the lad, to hunt for Lilia. That, thankfully, had so far ended in failure. Find her quickly, Damos, the high priest continued. You will leave nowhere untouched. The spell I cast will continue to muffle any sounds within the house only. Recall that at all times. I will hunt her down, great one, and she will not live long after that. The false Cedric accented his dire statement with an animalistic snort, then left again. Malik smiled at his captive. We will salvage this yet, it seems. Then you will be on your way to a long overdue audience with the Primus. They'll not let you out of Parfa, cleric, Uldisian snarled. The townsfolk loved Master Ethan. They'll stop you. They'll tear you apart for what you've done. But why should they stop me? Asked the malevolent figure, putting his monstrous palm to his face. As Uldisian was watching, stunned, the flesh moved to cover the revealed areas. In just seconds, Malik once again completely resembled the merchant, even to the difference in height. The spell that allowed him to walk in Ephon's flesh was an astonishing, if grisly, creation. Why would they stop their dearly beloved leader? Indeed, there was no reason, and Uldisian saw that. The guards and any bystanders would be fooled just as he had been, especially in the dark. She must be with one of the others, Malik went on, turning back to the question of Lilia. Perhaps she is already seducing one of them to take your place. The high priest could have never said anything more terrible in front of Uldisian. His blood boiled and a mindless rage swept over him. He shoved back in an attempt to free himself of the god's grips. But instead of the few steps back, steps during which he had hoped his captor's feet would trip, Uldisian and the two Morlu flew across the study. Across the study and through the window. Debris rained down on Uldisian as he and the Morlu fell. Despite their predicament, the bestial warriors clung to him as if their very lives depended upon doing so. Uldisian, in turn, tried to fold himself up as much as possible, aware that the ground was not at all far. They collided with a thud and a rush of dirt. The crack of bone echoed in Uldisian's ear. One of the Morlu let out a rasping cry, and his fingers slipped away from the captive's arm. Uldisian immediately tried to pull free of the other warrior, but that Morlu held fast. As the two rolled over, they came face to face. The night shadowed the Morlu's countenance much, but not enough at such close range to prevent the son of Diomedes from seeing the black pits where the eyes should have been. A fist in the Morlu's chin did nothing. Uldisian grabbed for the throat just as the foe did the same. The warrior's fingers all but threatened to crush his windpipe, yet for some reason the Morlu held back. It took Uldisian precious seconds to understand why. They still wanted him alive after all this. Why else try to take him in secret? However, while that gave him a bit of hope, he couldn't completely discount the Morlu for getting his orders, and finally simply killing the man with whom he struggled. What was staring at him from within that unsettling ram-skull helmet was not a human, not anymore. At any moment, his foe might become lost in bloodlust. With all of his will, Uldisian attempted to summon the same power that had thrown him and the two bulky adversaries so far away. Gritting his teeth, the farmer swung at the foe again, this time aiming at only one target, the heavily armored chest. The Morlu blocked his wrist, slowing the strike. The fist of Uldisian splayed open. His palm slapped lightly against the breastplate, hardly enough to do any damage. The Morlu went sinking into the ground, as if a huge, invisible hammer had struck him. He sank so deep that there was not even a trace of him left to see. Another hand seized hold, even as Uldisian sought to recover. Shouts erupted from everywhere, likely Master Ethan's gods coming to protect their employer and his property. 
Uldesian wanted to warn them of Malik's horrific masquerade, but the remaining Morlu, having recovered from the fall, now fell upon him in earnest. Perhaps recovered was not quite the correct word, for as the warrior spun Uldesian to face him, the son of Diomedes found himself staring at a head bent completely to the right. A good portion of the Morlu's neck stuck out in an obscene and impossible manner yet none of that appeared to matter to the furious creature. Once again, fingers clamped around Uldesian's throat. The Morlu squeezed, but not enough to kill. Uldesian's air was cut off. He knew that all the foe had to do was wait for him to pass out. Then, Malik would have his prey, and no one would be able to save Lilia. Reaching up, Uldesian grabbed hold of one side of the Morlu's head. Gritting his teeth, he pulled as hard as he could. With a horrible sucking sound, the head came free. The body of the Morlu shivered, and the fingers released. They grasped blindly for the head, which Uldisian pulled back. Like something out of a ghastly puppet show, Uldisian led the torso several steps towards the wall surrounding Master Ifan's estate. Then, with as much power as he could muster, he threw the head over. The torso lunged, only to collide with the wall. It repeated the attempt, but with the same result. On its third try, the headless body stumbled, then slid to the ground, where at last it stilled. Exhaling, Uldisian quickly looked back to the house. There was no sign of any activity in the study, but around the grounds, the guards scurried. Two of them closed on Uldisian. The moment that they recognized him, the pair slowed. He gestured at the house. Inside, there's more inside. Beware, you must cut off their heads. They looked at him with somewhat fearful expressions. Uldesian didn't care if they believed him. He ran past, already fearful that Malik had located Lilia, or any of the others for that matter. Bursting through the front door, he stumbled over something in the dark. Twisting around on the floor, Uldisian discovered to his horror a corpse which surely once belonged to one of the merchant household's servants. Once again, the contents of Uldisian's stomach threatened to come up, for the body had been completely and perfectly flayed. First Ifan and his son, and now this poor soul. Uldisian was caught between revulsion and bitterness. Each of the horrible demises could be tied to him. Yet Uldesian was not foolish enough to blame himself alone. Malik was the culprit who had done the foul deed. Malik at the bidding of the Primus. Anger once again overwhelmed him. There was nothing that Uldesian could do about the mysterious Lucian, but he could try to see about making certain that the High Priest troubled no one ever again, even if he had to sacrifice himself in the process. The guards he had spoken to stopped at the entrance, the torch in the hand of one illuminating the grisly scene for them. They stared round-eyed at Uldesian. Beware anyone in the house bearing a weapon, or anyone with the semblance of your master and his son. If they are truly Ifan and young Cedric, he had to choke back the emotions swelling up or else the guards would suspect the truth then they will understand that you locking them away is for their own safety. Lock them away? blurted one man in surprise. For their sake and yours, trust me. If Uldesian had been any other person, the men likely would have rejected his command. But they knew of his miracles. Uldesian cursed silently, wishing that more than a handful of people had exhibited some abilities akin to his own. At the moment, he would have been happy with Romus or Jonas at his side. Or Achilleos. The archer was his only hope. Achilleos had almost killed Malik once, and he could have killed one of the Morlu if aware how. As the gods sought to catch their wits, Uldesian raced up the steps to the next floor. Already he was picturing Lilia lying dead in the corridor, and the fear of that coming true urged him on despite his injuries and exertion. The room he shared with her lay directly ahead. Mustering his strength, Uldesian threw himself at the door. With a crash, it fell open. 
Uldisian immediately rolled to his feet, ready to face a hundred Maleks. But the sinister cleric was not there, and neither was Lilia. Instead, a frightened young woman huddled in the corner. Uldisian recognized her as one of the women Master Ifon had commanded to see to the noblewoman's needs while she was their guest. Where is she? he roared, ignoring her fear. Where is Lilia? Where is Lilia? The woman wordlessly pointed at a huge oak clothing cabinet. In addition to what she had been wearing on her arrival, she now had other garments procured for her by the host. The man had shown nothing but courtesy and care, and what had happened to him was a true nightmare that Uldisian would never forget. And worse, he now feared that it had also happened to the woman that he loved. Why else would a servant point at a shut cabinet and shiver with horror? Then something struck a chord. A servant, a household servant. Uldisian recalled the false Cedric, and how, despite his diminutive appearance, some spell surely hid from sight another monstrous Morlu or the like. Could it be? He whirled around almost too late. It leapt across the bed at him, a thing swollen beyond the proportions of the skin it wore. Rips and tears spread through the fragile flesh, and beneath them could be seen armor. The face was a contorted mask, no longer fitting. And, even as the horrific figure fell upon him, Uldisian could not help but marvel at how Malik's spellwork made size and shape of no consequence to the disguise. The two crashed into the cabinet, reducing it to splinters. Scraps of stolen skin dripping from the ghoulish countenance, the Morlu raised his hand, a hand in which he now held a savage, curved axe. With a grating laugh, he brought it down upon Uldisian.